around the world, we have to stop and ask our question, ourselves the question, is that the way that the writers of Scripture tell men to act? No. Christ would not have condoned it. Paul certainly didn't condone it. Peter didn't condone it. The Old Testament didn't condone it. That's not the way men are supposed to act. But I want you to notice how Genesis chapter 3, verse 16, the passage that I had Jose read a few moments ago, how it instructs us concerning the result of the curse. Now, I don't have it on the overhead, but forgive me for that. I missed that somehow. But in Genesis chapter 3, verse 16, at the latter part of the verse, God is, is laying out the effects of sin on man and woman, well, on creation, but specifically at this point, uh, He's talking to the woman about how the curse is going to affect her. And He says, Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Now there's some things that we need to consider. First, this is a statement of the effect of sin. It's a statement of the curse. He tells us that the wife will desire the husband's role. Your desire will be for your husband. He isn't simply saying, you'll want to be around the guy. No, it's the curse. It's the curse that's being related. He's saying, your desire will be to usurp the authority, to try to rise up and take on the role that your husband is supposed to carry. Your desire will be for your husband. It depicts the result of the corruption in the wife. That's the reason, ladies, why when we were talking with you, what were you called to do? Submit. You see? Again, the reversal of the results of the fall. But n notice what he says about the husband. And he shall rule over you. You see, that's what happens when men fall into sin. Instead of serving, the idea goes to ruling over. Get her under your thumb and make sure you keep her there because that's what she's there for. She's there to serve you, not you serve her. You don't need to honor her. She's not even fully human, according to some beliefs. Look at the Muslim religion, how they treat their women. Look at some of the other quote-unquote, great religions of the world. I've seen firsthand how Hindus treat their women. And it's utterly disgraceful. And the list could go on and on and on. The result of sin on the minds and hearts of men. But it is not to be so in the kingdom of God, in the new creation, Men are to honor their wives. You see, Genesis chapter 3, verse 16 is actually the beginning of those pagan views that we looked at last week concerning authority and responsibility. That's where it all started. That's when men started thinking about being served instead of serving. That's where it all began. So as new creations of the new kingdom. Believing husbands are to honor their wives in loving provision, service, and protection. We looked at that last week, but we needed to restate that once again. Men, we are to honor our wives. We are to consider them to be most valuable and precious. Outside of Christ Himself, as we're going to see next week, they are the closest earthly relationship we have. And boy, if we thought through that one for a little while when we consider those passages that call us to love our brothers, and that if we don't love our brothers, how can we say we love God? And that if we have ought against our brothers, 
leave our sacrifice, leave our gift, and first go and be reconciled to our brothers. If that's the case with our brothers, how much more in the closest earthly relationship that we have in this world outside of our relationship with Christ? Do you see how big this thing gets? And then you can understand why Peter says, so that your prayers will not be hindered. Peter says, if you're not loving your wives, if you're not honoring your wives like you should, you're certainly not loving your brethren like you should. Therefore, you can't love God like you should. Therefore, the, the, one of the greatest expressions of our relationship with God, our prayer life, means nothing if we are not in a right relationship with our wives. It's just that simple. By the way, you still have to come next week, although I just preached next week's message. But understand how serious this is, how vital this is. Secondly, Peter doesn't stop there. He goes on to tell us how that honoring plays out in addressing our wives. He tells us that honoring the wife as the weaker vessel shows the necessity of her as our associate. We use that term now to express those who, who, uh, who are helpers. For some reason we don't like the term helper, so we use the term associate. If you're at Walmart, you're an associate. Okay? Uh, you, you're, not, you're not a service person or a helper anyway, you're an associate. So we're an associate, okay? Men, we have to understand that honoring our wives means also considering them as the weaker vessel and what that means. Now this is generally the point at which feminists begin to throw things. They don't like the idea of the reference to, to the wife as the weaker vessel. But what they don't understand is what Peter is actually referring to when he says that. And he's going directly back once again to the creation account for the purpose that God made woman. And ladies, I think when we get finished with this today, if you understand what it is that God is saying when He talks about the weaker vessel, you'll gladly approve of being considered to be the weaker vessel. You see, Peter's reference to the wife as the weaker vessel isn't intended to be insulting or belittling. It is informing the husband of why he is to honor the wife. It's helping him to understand what her role is and how vital her role is and why then she should be so precious, so priceless to him. Now in Genesis chapter 2, verse 20, we have the beginning of the story there. And in chapter 2, two verse 20, it tells us, The man gave names to all the livestock, and to the birds of the heaven, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper fit for him, or suitable for him. And we, I think most of us know the story. You know, God had created all the animals, and he begins to, to, to bring them to Adam to see what Adam was going to name him. Now, God wasn't doing it for his information. It wasn't like God was going to say, hmm, I wonder what he's going to name this one. It was the fact that naming portrayed what? Authority. He had already directed Adam. He said, take authority over the creation. But notice even there, what's, what is Adam there to do? To tend it and keep it. To care for it. Once again, once again, what do we see? Provision, supply, care. So God brings all the animals, and, and Adam is naming the animals, and he gets finished, and still Adam has not found a helper suitable for him. And God actually says this. He says, you know, we use the plural we need to make a helper suitable for Adam. He, he doesn't have one. And the implication is what? 
He desperately needs one. He is in desperate